Okay, everybody. Hello. It's wonderful to be with you all today uh, here on this wonderful uh, Friday afternoon, at least as beautiful uh, where, where I'm at, uh, where, where Mark and I are. Um, I hope it's beautiful wherever, wherever you find yourself. I see we already have 37 people uh, joining with us. You know, even, even before we got started, there were, you know, 30 something people um, signed on. So that's really exciting to see. Glad to be with you all. And I see a number of you chiming in in the chat from uh, Catlin, Illinois, or Caitlin, Illinois, I'm not sure which, uh, London, Ontario. So we're going international here um, and seeing a lot of familiar uh, names in the comments. So thank you so much, everyone, for being with us today. Um, my name is John Lustria. I'm the Education Coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Mark Brizano. He's uh, an Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology at Johns Hopkins University. So thanks for being with us today, Mark. Thanks so much for having me, John. It's great to be back. Uh, this is going to be a, a really good one. We're going to be talking about eye injuries in the Civil War. Uh, and, you know, for the squeamish of you out there, we're going to do our best to, uh, uh, to keep it, um, you know, pretty, you know, we won't get into too many details, but it's, you know, inevitable when we're talking about bullets and eyes, it's going to get a little gross at times. So just prepare yourselves accordingly. <laughs> uh, before we get started, just want to say, you know, the, the usual stuff. Thank you for tuning in. If you like uh, these and other of our videos, go ahead and hit that like button uh, and subscribe to our channel if you don't already. That's the best way to stay up to date with all that we do. We uh, put out at least one new video every week on our YouTube channel. So uh, we stay pretty active over here. So that's an easy free way that everyone can support us. If you just like us and subscribe to the channel, that helps us out a lot. Um, and then if you want to take your support one step further, you can become a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine for as low as $25 a year. That's just a couple bucks a month. Um, you support programming like this and support our mission of connecting the past to the present. And we're going to be doing an awful lot of that today uh, because we're going to be looking at, uh, you know, eye injuries in the Civil War. We have a few case studies and Mark here, who is a, a present day practicing ophthalmologist, will kind of share with us, you know, maybe what he would have done different, maybe what he, he would have done the same uh, and, and, you know, everything in between. So he's going to have a more trained eye than than me, um, a historian. I'm a historian by trade and, and he's a medical doctor by trade. So to, with our powers combined, I think we're really gonna, we're really gonna get into some good stuff here. So thank you so much for tuning in. Um, well, <laughs> before I forget, it, it's a terrible joke, um, but we thought about calling this program The Eyes Have It, but uh, figure that might be, you know, maybe in a little bit of bad taste, but it's just too good of a joke not to, uh, not to mention. So I wanted to say that before I forgot because I love a good pun. So uh, in doing the research for this program, uh, I consulted heavily the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion. It's an incredible resource. Uh, it's all available for free online. If you just type in medical and surgical history of the Civil War, uh, something will come up. I'll post a link in the comments before we finish up today. Um, and there's all kinds of great information about, about eye injuries and, and every other kind of injury. I mean, it's, it's thousands of pages long. Um, there are only uh, less than 300 recorded instances of bullet wounds uh, of the eyes. Um, and that seems to be a low number, but again, those are recorded. Um, you had to be alive in order to make it to the field hospital, in order to be seen by the doctors, in order for the case history to be done up. So. When I start throwing out some, some statistics here, just keep in mind that there's a level of bureaucracy to all of this in that you need to be alive in order to be counted for this particular study. Uh, and as I was going through, some of these numbers were really surprising to me. So there were, they were the injuries were separated into two categories, soldiers shot in both eyes or soldiers shot in just one eye. Uh, and there were 39 cases of soldiers shot in both eyes. And only 11 out of those 39 cases uh, proved to be fatal. Uh, and the others ended up making a, a well, I don't know, I, I won't say a full recovery, but they ended up surviving, uh, which is 
better than I anticipated. And, and the odds are even better if you're shot in one eye. Of 254 cases, soldiers shot in one eye, only 20 were fatal. So only about a 10% mortality rate if you made it to the field hospital, um, critically. Um, so that, I think, just to start off with this kind of interesting, knowing some of those numbers, if you got to see Civil War medical attention, if you had an eye injury, your odds were not too bad if you could get there, um, which I think already goes counter to some assumptions that people have about um, you know, the type of medical care that was available during the Civil War, especially in an age where they don't know about germ theory, which I think will probably come up quite a bit in our discussion today. Uh, now, to, to start off with, my, my first question for, for you, Mark, and this is something that comes up quite a bit in, the, in some of these cases where the, the soldier shot in one eye, um, there were 91 cases of the 254 where uh, the one eye is injured and the other eye is affected sympathetically, um, either in total loss of sight or partial. Uh, how common is that for, you know, if you receive an injury to one of your eyes, that that kind of affects the other one? Yeah, you know, that's a really great question. And um, in these reports that you did a great job looking into and, and sort of digesting for us is that, you know, when they talk about sympathetically affected, um, there's this term that was coined in the last 100, 150 years called sympathetic ophthalmia, which basically refers to, um, as we know now, as a secondary inflammation, basically inflammation in the good eye, the fellow eye that has not been affected based on injury to the affected eye. And it was unclear at the time is uh, we've known about this phenomenon for, for thousands of years. The Greeks actually were the first ones to describe this condition where um, at least a little bit allude to it. There wasn't really great documentation about it, but basically when an eye gets traumatically injured, um, they found that the other eye would get this inflammation in it. There's some terms that um, more specific medical terms like iritis and and sort of specific types of inflammation within the eye, in the front of the eye, in the back of the eye. And then eventually it actually starts to scar down and shrink um, for this fellow eye. And so it wasn't really sure why that was happening. And then I think it was around 1840, Will, uh, William McKinley, I think it was his name, or basically had described around 1840 that was able to document precisely the clinical aspect. So it's, I guess, it's a few years predating to the Civil War, as happens, and John, you might be able to elucidate more into that than I can, but um, really just gave meticulous records on this. And now what we know is, is that um, antigens, so basically certain aspects or molecular signals within the cells of the eye, after the penetrating injury, it gets exposed to the rest of the body. So there's only a couple areas in the entire body where it's something called immune privileged. So what immune privilege means is, you know, if you think of your white blood cells, as you know, police officers going around your body. I don't know if anyone's seen that that cartoon movie decades ago, Osmosis Jones. You know, the police officers are the are the blood cells. That's basically what they're doing is they're going around, but they're not allowed in the eyeball or in areas like the testicles because if they did, both of those tissues would actually be scarred down and not usable anymore because the antigens can actually look much like other foreign cells that they would normally attack. However, it's when it's opened up from a trauma, that allows those white blood cells to get in there, recognize it as potential danger or a problem, goes back to the police station or your lymph nodes, and then will then attack the other eye. And there's actually a more sophisticated one, um, a really prominent scientist out of the NIH, uh, Dr. Neusenblatt, he was a legend in our field, uveitis uh, fellow, basically a specialist in inflammation of the eye who just recently died, um, actually did a lot of work elucidating some of this. And there's something called the acade. So basically they, they linked this to some antigens in the spleen because the spleen has a lot of uh, uh, immune tissue as well that's resulting in this. So anyway, a long story short is that with this condition, by opening up these antigens causes um, basically a misattack by the body thinking that the other eye is harmful when it's not. And so that's when you get this smoldering inflammation and not knowing anything about this, 
But knowing that there's devastating consequences afterward, the management for this was very limited at the time. And in terms of your original, going back to your original question, how common was this? Um, you know, the reports on it were very rare or scattered. And correct me if I'm wrong, John, but in the Civil War, I don't think there was actual specific ophthalmologists on duty in the during this. And so there's reports of it being really high. I think I saw like what, like 16% of, sympath of sympathetic ophthalmia after um, eye injuries, which is very high because the rest of the literature, at least that's from what's reliable, is less than 1%. It's actually pretty rare. So, um, you know, we're limited by like what John was saying is the bureaucracy, you know, what was actually recorded. Thankfully, this is a rare condition to have, and it's something we still think about even today, but um, it's probably less frequent than we think. And, you know, obviously they had a lot to worry about just in terms of trauma anywhere else and the survival of the patient. But, um, you know, going completely blind, even in those days with both eyes, you know, that's a pretty devastating outcome, even with survival. That, that's fascinating. Well, and uh, the, the rate uh, of which this kind of sympathetic ophthalmia is happening is even higher, higher than that 16%. It's closer to 30% um, that you cited. And it's, it's fascinating that that is in some ways, uh, I'll use some air quotes here, kind of the normal response of the body. You know, when there's a trauma in the eye, then they, the, the white blood cells can, can get in there. That's, they're kind of doing their job. I mean, they're doing it imperfectly because that's you know, not how it's all supposed to work, but it, it, it's fascinating that, that the reason that, that that happens is your body just kind of doing its thing. And it is in some ways um, not directly caused by the, the original trauma. That's kind of fascinating. I didn't expect that. It is. And, you know, there's definitely a lot of relevance to today about that. I mean, if we want to go delve a little bit deeper, it's actually a T-cell mediated process. So it's one that, you know, gets memory to the immune system. And so, we can actually use it to our advantage, you know, like we currently are now with the pandemic and vaccines, we actually use T cell response to be able to attack then antigens or the spike protein, for example, on the coronavirus, and then use that to our advantage. But sometimes in these situations, it use, it's against us, right? It's not helpful. So that's, that's the goal in medicine is we want to use things to sort of help us fight these problems and, you know, prevent it from causing problems um, in the wrong setting. And so um, we actually thankfully have ways to sort of treat it or prevent it now. Um, back then we didn't have steroids. Um, steroids are, you know, it's a very blunt instrument, but steroids are very useful that if it were to happen, we can use them to sort of dial down the inflammation uh, a bit, but it's, it is a tough to disease to treat when it does, it does occur. Yeah, very interesting. And, and you were correct in that um, the, during the Civil War, they're far from having, uh, you know, ophthalmology specialists, uh, you know, on board. Uh, the Civil War does give birth to a number of specialized fields in medicine, um, you know, including neurology and um, cardiology and, and a host of others, a reconstructive surgery and, and a number of things. I'm not sure if ophthalmology is one of those. I want to say it's not, but um, someone yeah. can correct me on that. Um, but we're during the war, we're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another question, something that, that also came up, I don't have specific numbers on this, but I, what I thought was kind of interesting, um, a number of the cases um, that the, the, these wounds, the, the patients who had them, uh, their sense of smell was affected. And obviously, you know, when we're talking about the face, you know, it's all kind of interconnected back there. Um, you know, so I, I'm guessing, you know, probably has something to do with that, but I'm, I'm curious, you know, if if uh, that's something that, you know, we still deal with today and, you know, what that whole process is like. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great, it was fascinating description that, that you found there. And um, I think a lot of that might just be from the initial gunshot trauma in that, you know, like you said, everything's intertwined there and the, the proximity of the anatomy is, is, is close there. And not to throw in a, I got to, since you had a corny joke, I got to do one myself. What did one eye say to the other? I don't know. Something smells between us. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, going back on that. So, um, you know, so basically there's a uh, coming out of the brain and basically innervating um, many of the structures on the head and neck area are actually 12 cranial nerves. 
And the very first one is the actual olfactory nerve, the one that is responsible for smell. And basically their projection straight out from in front of the cerebral cortex. And then cranial nerve two is actually the optic nerve. So they're actually very, the most, um, the most uh, highest nerves in terms of uh, ordered anatomy coming off of the brainstem. Now, the thing is, is when you're looking at, when you're looking at this with a gunshot injury, you have a lot of bones around the orbit here. And so in, in that case description, it sounded like it was so devastating. It took um, not only the eye, but also the orbital structures around it. And they could actually see the pulsatility of the brain at one point in one of those. And so if you're doing that and it gets, you get enough medial, meaning close enough to the center of the skull, I mean, there's no way, I don't see how it wouldn't be affected at that point. Um, and, you know, it, it, there's a lot of uh, clinical relevance to that today because, um, you know, if, with these kind of trauma cases, you know, the sad part is, you know, we think this is just a civil war, like this doesn't really happen that much anymore. But in reality, you know, we have quite a number of, um, you know, gunshot, accidental or, or, or um, intentional gunshot injuries today. And one of the most common reasons in many hospitals for being admitted to the trauma unit with a head and neck injury is from gunshots. The other one is obviously car, car crashes and motor vehicle accidents. And so these are still... Um, I shouldn't say a rare, but potentially uncommon or to less common, but still very prevalent issue that we deal with. And thankfully in today's world, like you said, we didn't have all these subspecialists back then. We often work in tandem with our neurosurgeons, otolaryngologists or ENT surgeons. And usually these are oftentimes combined cases in terms of repairing uh, structures um, around the eye and to save someone's life. And, you know, an unfortunate, um, challenges sometimes to repair these structures a lot of times even during the repair it can um, negatively impact any of these other nerves that are coming off and so there's some description to that too talking about the trigeminal nerves so that's cranial nerve five and that goes through the rest of the face as well um, and then there's a few others in between there as well yeah that's uh, a great point um, the the type of ammunition that the the soldiers are using during the civil war uh, the mini ball is um, a pretty imprecise instrument. And, uh, you know, that the mini ball is the reason that there were so many amputations during the Civil War, um, because when it strikes bone, it shatters the bone as opposed to just, you know, kind of a clean break. Um, and, and so, you know, shattered bone is shattered bone, whether that's in your arm or, you know, on your face. And, and we're going to get into a couple case studies uh, in just a moment here. And, you know, we can kind of track the path of the bullet a little bit here and we can see just how much damage it, it does. And that makes total sense that depending on, you know, the angle that the, the bullet is coming that, yeah, it's going to do some damage to the nose as well as the, as well as the eyes or, or eye. Um, we got a couple uh, good kind of questions and comments are good questions and, and comments in the comments section. Um, Leza O from Kansas City says, uh, seems as if there was a head injury during the Civil War, the likelihood of survival would be pretty low, regardless of a field hospital treatment and transport to medical center. Uh, and you're probably right about that. Unfortunately, we don't have as robust of statistics uh, for those that are just killed instantly uh, on the on the field. So, you know, we can't say with absolute certainty, but I don't think it takes a lot of imagination to suggest that yes, eye injuries are, are probably pretty likely to be fatal, you know, when, when you first get them, just because like we were just talking about, there's so much, you know, intricate and important uh, bits of organ going on there um, in that area. Uh, John Allen, says uh, his uh, two times great great grandfather lost his eye to a mini ball at the Battle of the Wilderness, uh, as did one of our case studies, which we're going to get to in a little bit. Said it uh, took him uh, about three weeks to get to uh, a general hospital in Washington, D.C., where um, uh, and he asked, you know, if he was judged mortally wounded and they put him aside. Um, and that's likely what happened and probably why it took so long, either that or they were concerned about transporting him safely, uh, one of those two things. And, and he does add that FYI, he did ultimately survive. So 
good for his uh, great great grandfather twice over. Um, Peg asks, were there any cases where soldiers regained their sight? Uh, and that does that does happen uh, uh, a few times. Um, they, they don't always comment on that, but sometimes it does kind of kind of kind of come back a little bit. Uh, and let's see uh, another another bad joke, um, which we, it seems to be a, a, a concurrent theme with with this conversation is the bad jokes. Um, this is this one from Robert McGuire he says, why are ophthalmologists slow to learn? Uh, because they're not very good pupils. <laughs> oh, good stuff. I love uh, a good bad joke. So uh, thank you all for, uh, for, for bearing with me in that regard. Um, I see we're, we're getting a few more questions, but uh, we'll kind of go back and forth between uh, one of my questions and some of your all's questions. So I want to share with everyone, this is kind of at the end of the section on eye injuries in the medical and surgical history. Uh, they have this to say at the end. And then, so I'll read this, Mark, and I'll be curious to get your kind of comments on this. This is their kind of, so what did we learn about eye injuries at the end of the Civil War? So the, the kind of narrative bits in the medical and surgical history are written in like the late 1860s, early 1870s. They're kind of collecting all the case studies and they're kind of offering reflections on them. So this is their reflection on eye injuries. The author writes, a general survey of the accounts of gunshot injuries of the eye reported during the war instructs us that whenever foreign bodies are lodged in the globe, they should be extracted at all hazards. If it is impracticable to find them, the globes should be uh, extrip extirpated in order to preserve the other eye. When general ophthalmitis has followed a gunshot injury, a free horizontal incision evacuating the contents of the eyeball should not long be uh, delayed. Absolute rest and strict diet and every precaution that may conduce to the preservation of the remaining eye should with sedulous solicitude be enjoined by the surgeon, uh, which is just a great Victorian turn of phrase, uh, which basically just means um, do it very seriously. Uh, in the cases complicated by fractures of the orbital region, it was plainly shown that it was unwise to remove the fragments of bone primarily unless they were so detached as to serve as foreign bodies. So hearing that, Mark, I'd be curious for your, your comments on that kind of grand assessment on basically what they learned. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I have to think about things in the context of that time. And I think it was definitely a reasonable framework for how to approach these cases. I mean, we're, we're blessed now to have um, so much more advanced tools and things needed to treat these cases. So there's a little bit, uh, maybe that's a, maybe I've minimized things too much, but there's been a bit of a, of a, a treatment paradigm shift, I think, in terms of that. But some of the concepts are still very much uh, apparent today with that. So it's absolutely true. If there's a foreign body there in the eye, we should go and take it out. You know, right, any, right. You know, in, yeah. in some ways, it's it's almost a little comical. It's like you know this grand academic review, and it's like if you get something in your eye, get it out. <laughs> yeah, like, right. Oh, exactly. Right. Great insight. <laughs> yeah. No. Definitely. And. Um, you know, it's it's actually quite fascinating. So so um, to give some background, I'm a vitreo retinal surgeon. So I, uh, as part of my training, I do surgery in the back part of the eye, but also trauma that involves the eye and removal of foreign bodies. And uh, I'm one of the things that's actually still very relevant is it sounds quite barbaric that huge uh, wound to pull things out, but sometimes it actually does require a sizable incision to get something out. Um, you know, that's why even today it's, it's very important. Everyone working with metal always put on safety glasses. You know, those things are projectiles. They're all, they might not be exactly like a mini ball from the civil war, but they can certainly act like one. And when they get, and you know, the best thing to do is just prevent this from happening altogether. So we're much more advanced and sophisticated now where a lot of times there can just be clean, entries into the eye and it stays there, but it's still an emergency. And so what we do is we go in, it's called a vitrectomy, where we actually go into the side of the eye, we take out the jelly part of the eye that's naturally um, in between the lens and the retina, and we can actually evacuate the foreign body that way. 
either um, with these very uh, microscopic and delicate forceps or other things. We actually borrow an instrument from our urology colleagues, um, urologists, there's actually a kidney stone basket. Whereas if it's big enough, we can actually insert that through the side of the eye and we can actually take out um, foreign bodies that if they're really big. And thankfully it's not very common that we have to do this, but um, you know, that's, that's where um, some crosstalk between the different surgical specialties is really helpful. But it was not like it was then where the system didn't exist until you know, several decades ago. So this is a much more recent advancement. And um, given the time, you know, that's, you know, they're very limited in what you could actually do. Yeah, again, there's that uh, cross specialist conversation that is working to our benefit today that you know, the Civil War soldiers at the time didn't have the, the, the benefit of. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's just continually astonishing to me the kind of precision with which that we can operate today. You know, you're talking about microscopic forceps. I mean, that is just amazing to me. Um, let's see, we got, uh, well, the, the, the person which shared the most recent joke uh, went on to say, uh, Robert McGuire, they're a former head and neck nurse. So facial trauma is uh, right in their, in their wheelhouse. And, and they asked uh, if surgeons of that time subdivided ocular trauma by cause, uh, whether shrapnel, bayonets, gunshot wounds, et cetera. Uh, and if so, what was the greatest cause of ocular trauma? Um, they didn't subdivide it, um, but it was almost exclusively gunshot wounds, at least that are recorded, um, that are recorded. So that's, uh, that's that. Um, and we had a, a great comment from um, uh, Chow Chow Girl in the comments. She says, uh, speaking as an RN, uh, I wish you guys were accredited to offer continuing education units. This is great info relating to anatomy and physiology to real life trauma and care options. And this is something that actually we have, we at the museum have kind of toyed with a little bit. Um, it's something that we may do at some point down the road. Uh, we're not quite uh, there yet, but uh, so uh, glad to hear someone say that that's something they'd be interested in. Um, so anyway, thanks, uh, thanks for that. Um, so at this time, uh, we're going to go ahead and, and get into um, uh, our case studies here. Uh, now, Mark, how do you want to do this? Do you want me to just kind of read the whole thing in its entirety uh, and then you kind of say something at the end? Or do you want me to read and then you just stop me when there's something interesting? What would you prefer? Yeah, we could do it either way. I like the sort of back and forth is, is certainly very good and or if you think there's a good stopping point and uh we can discuss then too all right i'll um let me see here so there there's kind of so this this first case is a little bit shorter um so there's the the kind of actual instance of the injury and and what happened to him and then there's kind of a pause and then there's sort of an autopsy of sorts so i'll i'll stop in the middle there and we'll we'll separate it that way so the, the first case is one of Charles C., um, no last name given, Charles C. of the 30th North Carolina, uh, Company H. Um, so he was aged 30 years old, and he received this wound at the Battle, Battle of the Wilderness, uh, May 7th, 1864. So a gunshot wound to the face, quote, the missile entered the left temple, passing obliquely anteriorly, and emerging one inch below the left eye, severely fracturing and uh, commuting the superior maxilla and completely destroying the nasal bones. He was among the captured wounded and sent on a hospital transport to Washington. And on May 14th, so a week after he was injured, May 14th was admitted to Carver Hospital. He was very low and in a comatose state, requiring considerable exertion to arouse him sufficiently to partake of food and stimulants, which were freely administered. He took a quart of milk punch daily. Detergent lotions were applied to the wound. The contents of the left orb were evacuated and the vision was destroyed in the right eye. Inflammation gradually extended to the brain without any very violent symptoms. The patient survived 20 days death resulting May 27th, 1864. So that's the, the first half of the, of the block there. Any comments on, on what we've read so far, Mark? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it was a great job by them in terms of documenting 
exactly where things are. The nomenclature for a lot of these is uh, very similar. We still use terms like, you know, the maxilla, uh, nasal bones. I mean, it's, you know, if there are ethmoidal, ethmoidal bones, the sphenoid bones, if there's a little bit more um, specifics there, it'd be helpful, I think. Um, but uh, it's really interesting um, for a couple things that, that come to mind. One is the, so first, um, with that entry point through the side of the temple here, and then going down the inferior maxilla is basically around here, right below the eyes, the bottom of the orbit. And then you've got the superior, so you have the, and then the, you know, the maxillary bone involves the inferior part of your orbit. And so based on that trajectory here, and assuming, you know, the mini ball that you're talking about, and it expands, probably not unlike a shotgun, some kind of shotguns today, I'm sure, depending on the range of them, um, you know, and especially with the nasal fractures next to it, if you follow that um, trajectory path, if it wasn't the eye getting affected directly by itself, I would definitely expect the optic nerve to be involved on that. And so, um, and that's because the optic nerve actually travels through what's called the sphenoid bone, the optic canal to go back straight to the brain. And, um, and it's right behind, obviously, the eye and the eye, it goes, travels um, posteriorly and uh, centrally or medially, as we call it. So, so it seems that it would evolve in that direct path. Um, so if the eye wasn't affected, the cable connecting the eye to the brain was definitely affected, also known as the optic nerve. Now, the other part of that, too, is it's interesting they talk about an inflammation getting to the brain. They don't talk about an infection, which... In my mind, you know, because the sympathetic ophthalmia affecting, you know, the other eye that we we're talking about earlier, since it's a T cell mediated response, like we were saying before with the white blood cell police and whatnot, it can happen before three weeks. But typically, the vast majority of these cases happen between three weeks and a year after the initial trauma. And that's because a T cell mediated response, like a response to many conditions, takes time for the immune system to recognize it and to respond to it. Now, uh, with it being a week later and the inflammation increasing, I'd imagine it's probably infection related. And this predates the use of antibiotics, which I'm sure could have really helped this patient out quite a bit. Um, and so unfortunately, they didn't have that. And that was one of the you know, big hallmarks and advancements of medicine, in addition to vaccines, you know, later on, uh, that really kind of changed the landscape of healthcare. Yeah, and, and specifically about the infection, uh, my gut suggests that that probably is indeed an infection uh, because, not because I know anything about medicine really, <laughs> um, oh, but, but just because they, they don't have the verbiage to really kind of describe infections. Um, and and in some, to some extent, they're kind of not aware that, I mean, they, they know that infection is a thing that like, you know, there are complications after surgery, et cetera, um, but they don't exactly understand where it comes from uh, and specifically even really what it is. So um, you see inflammation as a descriptor a lot in, uh, in case, case histories like this. So it, it likely probably was. And, and if we were to guess, I mean, obviously there's the trauma of being shot in the face, but I would imagine that probably you know, was a pretty big contributing factor to his uh, ultimate demise, right? His, mm. his death. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, and to give them some credit, you know, it is inflammation. It's just very <laughs> important to know that an infection is a cause of the inflammation. So, right. you know, so it's true. It's just not the whole picture. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I almost forgot. So we actually do have an image of this particular. So it, now, now no one be alarmed. This isn't graphic. It's, it's uh, a, a skull. It's a pencil sketch. So it's not a photograph. Um, so this, this is the, the skull in question, and this is uh, currently in the collection of the National Museum of Health and Medicine. So if we, you know, in a world where we had unlimited access to this museum, uh, we could uh, go there and, you know, ask to see this. And if they were very nice, they'd say, sure. Um, so this does exist uh, out there. And this, I think, will be relevant as I read the, the next part of this, which is sort of the kind of the autopsy uh, portion. And, and pardon me, Mark uh, slash everyone, as I am likely about to butcher some medical terms here. Well, John, I, this is beautiful. I wish every radiologist did a hand sketch for all my patients like this, you know, no, <laughs> I'm kidding. 
<laughs> yeah, it's uh, and and there's a number. So there's not a hand sketch for for every case in the medical and surgical history, but there's a lot of them, and they're. Mm -hmm. You know, at the very least, as pieces of art, they're they're actually fairly beautiful, um, and they're incredibly useful for us today um, as, as we we talk about it. So, yeah. um, to to continue here, acting assistant surgeon J. E. Winnetz reported the case and sent the specimen, which you all are looking at right now, to the Army Medical Museum, which is today the National Museum of Health and Medicine. The right malar, the bodies of both superior maxillaries both lacrimal bones, the body of the ethmoid with the turbinated bones, the left great ala of the sphenoid, and the left external angular process of the frontal with the orbital plate have been carried away. The left uh, pared paretal uh, is fissured from the anterior angle to the parietal eminence. The left palate bore is fractured across the sphenoid cells are exposed and the cranial cavity is freely opened. The edges of the fractured bones are slightly uh, necrosed and show traces of an attempt uh, at repair. So I guess that's basically the, you know, using medical terminology, basically just describing the image we're looking at here. Is that, is that right? That is, and it's a very good description. So that it seems they were using essentially the same terminology that we would and, um, uh, you know, looking at, it's exactly right, that black area in the middle of this picture here, that's clearly the cranium, which, you know, is a part of the skull that holds the brain, is widely open here. And as you listed out, those bones that are fractured and involved are clearly responsible. And you see those holes um, in that really thin plate there. Um, that's, you know, the, that's the involvement with the sphenoid and ethmoidal bones. Um, and again, that carries the optic nerve. So that direct injury would have caused vision loss had he survived anyway from that. Um, and this is right, you know, this, the sinuses and whatnot are all right in that area. And so, um, sadly, you know, every surgery does have complications. It's not uncommon for, um, even, even, uh, for brain trauma or other cranial or even, um, otolaryngolic trauma or other surgeries, um, you know, if you go a little bit too far, uh, a centimeter or two in the wrong direction, you know, right inside one of these thin walls is, uh, you know, an optic nerve or any other nerve. And so, you know, if it's not vision loss, sometimes, you know, you can get other types of deficits around the face. But, you know, I think the sophistication of all our surgical specialties are increasing to the point where these complications are thankfully um, decreasing as time goes on. Um, but yes, this is an excellent image that shows it. The bottom part of that orbit there, of that trauma there, that shows the maxillary bone involvement they were talking about before. Um, and then you work your way up and that's the frontal bone. Uh, that's that jutting out process that uh, John, you were just describing there. And further deep into this bone is those ethmoidal and sphenoidal bones that make up the other part of that orbit there and open up really to the cranium. and. Some of this can be hard to piece together with two-dimensional images like this. So you have to think a little bit three-dimensionally to get the whole picture here, but this is basically it. And this is a great, this is probably one of the best, uh, one of the best sketches I, I've seen. Yeah, and again, there's a, there's a lot of really, really, really good ones in the medical and surgical history. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's far from a picture book. It's pretty dense, but uh, if you want to treat it as such, it, it's, it's not bad. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, uh, cause I want to get to the, the second case, uh, that spoiler alert, this person does survive. I wanted to end on a little bit happier of a note. Um, so I, I want to, I'm sure there's a number of questions in the comments. I want to get through this, uh, and then we'll take a few questions and then we'll probably wrap up here. Um, so this case, uh, is for private Jonas Array, E-R-R-A-Y, Array, I guess, um, the, of the 10th New York Cavalry. Um, and this is, this is a bit longer, it's broken up in more places, so we'll, we'll go through it, you know, one chunk at a time. Uh, age 23 years, uh, Private Jonas Array was wounded near Shepherdstown on July 16, 1863, by a conoidal musket ball, which entered the frontal bone one inch above the right superciliary ridge near the median line, 
passed downward and outward and lodged in the superior maxillary bone. Insensibility of four or five hours duration followed the injury. The patient remained at the field hospital until July 30th, uh, about two weeks basically, and was then conveyed to hospital number one at Frederick, which is just a few blocks away from the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, um, about a half mile south of us. The wound had nearly uh, uh, sciatrized. Uh, uh, cicatrized, probably. Cicatrized. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what is that, the wound had cicatrized? Uh, that, that means it's sort of scarred, scarred down, cicatricial. Yeah. So, so that, that word is actually still, I guess, in use. It does sound a little antiquated though. But, yeah. uh, so the wound had nearly cicatrized, but the pulsations of the brain were plainly visible. Uh, the sight of the right eye was destroyed and sensibility on that side of the face was lost. On August 2nd, pain in the head uh, supervened due in measure to the irritation produced by the injured eye with which moreover the sound eye sympathized. So that's the first chunk. So he's been injured, he's made it uh, to a field hospital uh, and then to a more permanent kind of long-term care general hospital. Um, and there's a lot going on. So, so break it down for us, Mark. Yeah, no, definitely. So, um, you know, the, the, so the involvement of the other eye, right. And then they're, they're talking about the entry wound and that sort of part of a healing process. Sometimes you get the scar formation is really what cicatricial means is that it's forming sort of the scar. And then they're talking about the other, uh, neurologic kind of function around the head and the neck. So, Again, we're talking about um, smells, that cranial nerve one. We've got sensation that's primarily, you know, cranial nerve five. There are three different divisions of it. Um, you have the cranial nerve one. It goes up to the front, grossly goes up to the top part of the head. Cranial nerve two to the middle of the head and three goes down here. And so um, cranial nerve five can obviously get, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a big cranial nerve relative to the other ones. Um, and so that's, uh, clearly gets involved as well. And so anytime, like we were talking about, you know, the, just the condensed nature of a lot of the anatomy here, um, that, that can certainly happen. And like we were talking about before, you know, it's, it's hard based on the bureaucracy of this, um, you know, how much training or expertise we have in this to just, I think it was, you know, sympathetic ophthalmia or was sort of at the height of what people knew about with eye injuries. And so I think it was quick to diagnose with that, but whether it's truly something that got found me is hard, right? And so, um, so jumping right to that, I'm not fully convinced. I mean, I think when um, just based on the projection of it coming into that other eye, I think there's a high possibility, again, this could just be another infection than spreading to the other eye and they just don't know it's infection. Um, cause again, it's inflammatory. So, you know, any, a lot of different things can cause inflammation. Um, and you know, it's obviously not a good prognostic sign to see pulsatility of the brain. And so, you know, really just making sure, you know, we're, we're grateful to have those kinds of, um, techniques and abilities to address these, uh, traumatic injuries, um, rapidly here today. Indeed. Um, and, and I think you're right on, um, you know, based on your expertise, which I would defer to 10 times out of 10 <laughs> over mine. Um, you know, I, I think they're just like you said, I think you're probably right. They're quick to use the, the sympathetic word um, because that's the language that they're familiar with. Um, a lot of times you kind of have to read between the lines a little bit through some of the language, um, uh, especially um, uh, with, with the word fever, um, they, they toss the word fever around all over the place. You know, it, it could just be a regular fever. It could be an intermittent fever. It could be a rheumatoidal fever. It could be a, a typhidic fever. I mean, they love the word fever and that could be indicative of any number of, of sicknesses, of course. Um, and so it's, it, it's inherently challenging. And that's why um, we often say, um, you know, with, you know, really all kinds of uh, diseases, you know, in the 19th century, be very careful to kind of rever reverse diagnose. I mean, you know, make your best guess, you know, to your heart's content, but, uh, you know, we're very hesitant um, to definitively say, oh, it was definitely X, Y, or Z that they had. Yeah. Um, 
So uh, yes, I, I think you're probably right. It's it's more likely that if there's an infection going on than uh, than some sympathetic ophthalmia. Given you know what you said, how uncommon it it, it really is. Yeah, yeah, no, and like you said, it, we have to take a lot of these documents with a grain of salt, and just in some ways, you have to make the best best guess that you can. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty when it comes to to these types of things, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, it's, um, it, that is interesting with, you know, throwing the fever part around, you know, in those days too, like we, we can collect so much data now and relative to what's collected then it's, uh, it's a lot different. And when you have a couple of things in your toolbox, like checking for a fever and that's kind of all you have, you know, you don't have, you know, they're not doing necessarily your analyses back then. Um, just as a side note, you know, that's where, term diabetes mellitus comes from sweet tasting urine they would you know check the urine by tasting it if it tasted sweet you're figured to have diabetes like that's where that comes, we don't do that now or at least my boss hasn't asked me to do that um <laughs> but that's just like another example you know we have much better diagnostic capabilities now which you know they're very limited mm -hmm. yeah and, and so when you do you know read these resources just keep in mind um you know the, the language with which they're working. And, you know, as long as you kind of keep that in mind, it can be a really useful tool. Um, so anyway, the, the case goes on here. Uh, the pain continued unabated. Acting assistant surgeon John H. Barthoff uh, extirpated on August 11th, the right organ of vision. Love that description of an eye, the right organ of vision. Yeah, no, that's a great one. Uh, we know exactly what happened there, but that those terms we wouldn't actually use. So we, uh, the organ of vision is the eyeball. So we usually call that the globe in medical terms. Um, but I mean, cause you could argue like the optic nerve is also an organ of vision. Um, and that's, uh, just as important. Um, the other thing is the word extirpated. Um, we usually have, when it comes to removing the eye, um, God forbid we need to, some of the other reasons we would do it, um, would be, um, in adults, uh, thankfully, it's rare, but the most common cause of um, primary cancer within the eye. So rather than it spreading from elsewhere in the body, but um, an eye itself having the cancer where it first develops uh, would be a uveal melanoma. So um, you would think you, we instantly think of a melanoma, the skin or cutaneous melanoma. The only different, the only similarity between the two is the word melanoma, but it's actually um the only similarity is the origin cell is called a melanocyte. Anyway, if it's big enough um, inside the eye and the eye cannot necessarily be saved, then that's when the eye would be taken out. Um, and that's called an enucleation is when you take out the whole eyeball itself um, and you leave the eye muscle. Sorry if this is a little gruesome for some in our audience, uh, just to give a little bit of background. So there's more specific terminology that we use. And then um, so that to give it a good cosmetic function, because I, in these days, I'm sure the tissue was just removed, it sounded like, but there was no implant put in place. But um, we have really good ocularists on our teams um, across the country and elsewhere where um, they can do these implants that can almost fool anyone that, uh, uh, I guess, a fake or second eye that looks almost identical to the original eye. Like without me putting you at the slit lamp, I can't even tell the difference, you know, where an ophthalmologist can't tell. And it's so good. The artwork and the thought they put into this is really crucial. It's really impressive. But uh, an implant can be placed that the eye muscles are then stitched to and then, the Im and then a cosmetic surface implant can put it on top of it. And so that follows an enucleation. The other one is a evisceration. So that's where you actually scoop out the inner contents of the eye and then you leave the rest of it. And that was thought to reduce the chance of infection spreading through the optic nerve to the brain. And so this is classically what's taught to reduce infection spreading elsewhere. Um, it's not great evidence for it versus the other aspect of it, but that is also a practice. But extirpation, we don't really use anymore. And it sounds like that might just be used for nucleation. The other thing could be confused for um, is uh, exenteration. So what that means is, um, let's say you have cancer around the eye or um, some other issue surrounding the eye and just really bad damage. They'll actually take not only the eyeball, but the surrounding orbital tissue 
and sometimes um, bones and skin even around the orbit, extending elsewhere into the face of the cranium, and that's called an exenteration. Um, so anyway, sorry, were you about to say something there, John? Uh, no, just uh, you know, who knew there were so many uh, so many different terms for the kind of differing levels of the procedures, and and I think you're correct based off what I've read. Uh, extirpation seems to be pretty much synonymous with enucleation. Um, so, yeah, and sometimes uh, and, we'll do those with our colleagues, you know, the ENT surgeons as well. Um, we work very closely with them. Um, they're experts mostly with the face around around those issues. So that's what we um, typically do there too. Gotcha. Uh, and, and just a quick note on on implants in the Civil War. You know, fake fake eyes. Um, they were actually pretty uncommon, at least for the, the gunshot wounds, um, because the, oftentimes the socket was disfigured to the point that there was just not a convenient or a good way um, to, to make that happen. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, it continues. Uh, the headache still continued until August 20th. So this is uh, nine days after the procedure. And giddiness was produced by the least exertion. The power of feeling of smell uh, in the right nostril had by this time somewhat improved. On the 28th of the month, the socket of the right eye was granulating healthily and there was only little discharge from the original wound. Um, on October 1st, the wound had so far healed that the pulsations of the brain ceased to be visible. On November 3rd, the missile was detected behind the last molar tooth and extracted by the dressing forceps. The sensibility of the fifth pair of nerves was now restored by the mobility of the jaw, uh, uh, but, but the mobility of the jaw remained limited. Um, so it sounds like, you know, months after this, basically they, they found the bullet, you know, in the far back and they finally, finally took that out. Uh, any comments on, on that, you know, what we just covered there? Yeah, I, I think it's impressive, you know, they're documenting sort of a little bit of that recovery there and how even um, with nerve damage and whatnot, like with the smell, with the, you know, facial sensation, you know, the human body is able to, you know, heal quite a bit, which is really, really impressive. And, um, you know, and it's good documentation there, you know, fifth cranial nerve coming in, innervating those areas. Um, so, you know, there is definitely a good, um, under, there's a I would say a great understanding of anatomy in that sense. It just seems like the real limitation here is, uh, you know, pathophysiology, I would say <laughs> from that time. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a fair assessment. And, um, oh shoot, I thought I had another another point, but um, yeah, so the, the, the documentation of, you know, how the patients, you know, proceed uh, is good. Oh, right. The, the point that I was just going to make is, you know, it's, it's amazing how seemingly delicate and fragile the human body can seem. And then it's at other times how incredibly robust and, you know, you know, it's, it's amazing what human bodies can recover from um, and how seemingly they're super strong and super weak all at the same time. I mean, it's just such a interesting kind of paradox that I'm sure you as a doctor, you know, think about all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. This is all can be a challenge for sure. But yeah. uh, so coming to a close here, uh, the patient was discharged from service on November 16th, 1863. So uh, exactly four months after the initial wound, the pathological specimen, and we don't have a sketch of this, but I'd be very curious. Pathological specimen exhibits the cornea and lens of the right eye. The uh, Vit vitreous humor in great part remains opaque and of a yellowish white color. A collection of clotted blood fills the anterior portion of the cavity uh, protruding through the iris. Pension examiner J.K. Stanchfield reports that on December 21st, 1863, that the opening in the forehead is not yet closed and sometimes discharges, but that he did receive a pension. So uh, our, our soldier here survives. Um, but he, uh, he still got some ongoing complications. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on the, the final bit there? I, this is my favorite part because it most directly relates to what I do now. And, right. uh, you know, if this were to happen today, I would like to think we maybe could have saved this because, um, you know, they do a very good job of describing it. The vitreous humor is what we were talking about before, that jelly part of the eye. 
we haven't known or learned or had the capability of entering that area safely until a few decades ago. And so it's really exciting because based on what they're describing there, you have this yellowish type of opacity in that area. And so that could be a couple different things. We already know there's blood there. So more than likely that yellowing could be what's called demohemoglobinized blood. So that's basically when blood has sit there for a while, you know, kind of like a bruise. If you ever get a bruise, it changes color and it turns yellow over time. That's the components of it being broken down gradually. And so that could just be some blood there. But the other cause of having opacification in the vitreous could also be detached retina. So the retina, um, when it scars down as well, and along with that blood, there's, it doesn't sound like there's any mention of retina there. So um, if there was a detachment of the retina, that's something that we could try to fix. It's a lot harder with trauma um, and it depends on the kind of trauma, but um, these are things, but there are techniques that we can do to help save it and to evacuate that blood and to be able to save the eye. And actually the first time that is still experimental, obviously the first vitrectomy to go into the area of the eye was with a patient with diabetes and really bad proliferative disease. They actually had a bleeding into this cavity and we found that um, I think I think the Americans would like to think we did it first, but it sounds like it might have actually happened in Japan a couple of years before. Uh, it's a little bit contentious right now. Either way, very early ophthalmologists or retina surgeons a few decades ago go into there and evacuate it. So Makamer is the one in our field who did this, um, and afterwards uh, restored vision just by clearing the blood. And it was actually very lucky that um, there wasn't detached retina or other parts limiting vision at that point. And so if that's all it was, was a bleed, that would have been very helpful, but there's clearly other aspects of the trauma here to that eye that certainly limited the visual capability. Fascinating. Yeah, it uh, didn't even occur to me that of course this would be your, you know, right right in your window of, <laughs> uh, of expertise here, especially. I mean, you've, you're certainly more expert than me. Um, than Unintended I Unintended there with a window, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, uh, well, th this has been great. We're coming to the end of uh, our time and, and there's just, um, you know, uh, everyone has been chatting away, you know, in the, in the chat and, you know, I'm glad you all have been having, uh, you know, a, a good discussion. We definitely don't have time to, to get to all of those, but, uh, you know, in the, in the coming days, um, you know, I'm hoping to, uh, you know, go through and, and try and tackle some of those questions and, and pass on any that I can't tackle uh, on to Mark. So um, we're going to have to to wrap up here. Um, thank you so much, Mark, for uh, for joining us today. This was this was a blast. I, uh, I really, really enjoyed this. Likewise, thanks so much for having me and talking about one of my favorite things. <laughs> yes, the uh, the eyes have it indeed. That's right. <laughs> And uh, thank, uh, thank you to all of you who, who tuned in uh, to, to watch today. Uh, and if you're just tuning in late and maybe you missed the beginning, uh, good news, as soon as we finish up the live stream, it will continue to exist on the museum's YouTube channel. So you can go back and watch it again. Maybe you missed something or you, know, you didn't quite catch what one of us said. Um, you can go back and, and uh, take a look at that. Um, so... Uh, best way to stay up to date with us uh, and support us for free, which everyone can do, and it'd be, uh, be immensely grateful if you all did, uh, if you go ahead and like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's the best way to keep up to date with uh, all the programming we've got going on. Uh, and if you want to take your support to the next level, um, consider becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, membership low as, as low as $25 a year, you support programming like this. Um, so, uh, and just to note next week, we're coming at you. Uh, this will be a pre-recorded program next week, uh, but we're continuing our on tour series. We're gonna be talking about medical care uh, on the South Mountain Battlefield. Um, so that's coming to you this upcoming Tuesday. So get excited for that. Uh, more great programming coming to you next week. And uh, until then, have a great day, everybody. Thank you, John.